unit of celebration, and at this point we'd like to have um, introductions, so we'll start with um, Cynthia Benjamin, if you'll start with the introduction of the one. Oh, Cynthia Benjamin. Greg Dingwood, Karen. Good evening, I'm Mary Sewer, manager of payroll and accounting. Mary Lou Paris, purchase and business manager, good evening, everyone. Thank you, senior programmer, Alex. Cheryl Penny, manager of work processing. Ashley Garrow with the little doctor. Program Manager, Anna Anderson, Program Manager, Ernest Good evening, Cynthia Alexander, Program Manager. Mary Graver, Program Manager. Alan Smith, Department of Developmental Services, Liaison to IRC. Beth Chains, Clinical Services Manager. Mark Henry, Consumer Support Technician of Central File Slash Case Control, <laughs> Consumer Advocacy Committee Member, and son of former board member Kathleen S. Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Jo Bacon, Program Manager, Intake and Assessment Unit. Good evening, Gina Gregory, Program Manager, IRC. Good evening, Susan Gomez, Another Way Director. Christy Burchett, Parent. Vicki Smith, Executive Director, State Council on Developmental Disabilities, Area Board 12. <coughs> Therese Cragness, Owner Operator, Innovative Business Partnerships, and Family Member. Maurice Cragness, Co Owner, Innovative Business Partnerships. Also here. Family member conservator. Nancy Newman, family member and conservator. Patricia Harold, Inland Regional Center. And you guys with me, I'm Stephen Miller, CITU, uh -oh. and Leah Zondi, the Consumer Advisor Committee. Took your fender. Thank you. and that's my main tag. <laughs> <laughs>
Tom goes down. Now we're going to uh, have our public input, and we will have no more than five minutes each. And our first person will be Vicki <coughs> Smith from Harry Bridgewell. doesn't add up about the math though because most people don't look like they're over 21 and if they were here in 71 something doesn't add up so that being said, I also realize the difference between a board member and a bureaucrat now when I uh, started my first I would say project uh, momentum uh, here at Inland when I was in my past life um, there was people two people pulling me from uh, from both sides and I remember a very wise person telling me once that one of them did the right thing for the wrong reasons and the other one did the wrong thing for the right reasons. And the difference between the bureaucrats and people who give up their time to sit on these boards is that you're supposed to do the right thing for the right reason. And that's what differentiates a board member from a bureaucrat. So I want to thank folks that give their time to do that. Uh, that being said, um, it's really, I'm here to, I, I was going to come and tell you about all the great things going on, but we're kind of at a stalemate. So, um, I do have a question, and it's more of a point of clarification. Um, I haven't seen anything from July 1st on of any contracts that have been reviewed by the board. So it's just a point of clarification. Has Inland Regional Center not issued any contracts that exceed $250,000 since July 1st? I haven't seen anything come before the board. Um, that would be even a residential home, level four that's licensed for a uh, vendor for four beds, it exceeds the $250,000. So I haven't seen anything come through the board for board review or for public uh, to hear the board review. Uh, so it's a point of clarification as to whether the, this regional center has issued a contract, any contract that exceeds $250,000 since July 1 of 2011. That was a requirement, uh, for those of the board that may, just need a reminder, that was a requirement in trailer bill language that the board must review uh, any contract that's issued out. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Next we'll have uh, Christy Burchette. Oh, good evening. Um, I have a right to, um, to go over uh, basically a requirement in the legislation that was passed in March 2011. And it's in regards to the Welfare Institutions Code 4629.5. And basically, <clears throat> this particular statute has to do with transparency and having items on the website, um, such as uh, <coughs> annual independent audit. And by the way, I should mention that was passed with urgency in March 2011. And here we are a year later. 
and the, the, the website does not have these items mm -hmm. on it. Um, so independent audit, biannual fiscal audit, regional center annual report, contract award, purchase of service policies, names and types of services and contact info for all vendors, except consumers or family members, board meeting agendas and approved minutes of open meetings of the board, bylaws of the board, uh, annual per performance contract. It goes on and on and on. <laughs> I won't go over everything. But it's, but it's right there codified in 4629.5 of the Welfare and Institutions Code. So I wanted to bring that to your attention because it's now been a year and it was passed with urgency. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I, I wanted to bring to your attention is tomorrow there's going to be a hearing in Sacramento, I believe at 1.30, televised on Cal Channel, having to do with abuse at some of these institutions. <clears throat> and um, I encourage you guys to, to watch that. And <clears throat> lastly, something I've brought forward before, I thought I'd take the time to bring it forward today. I really urge this regional center to consider a parent advisory committee. We have an advisory committee for consumers. We have one for vendors. Um, we really need one for parents. Uh, a lot of parents feel strongly about that. And I would really like to encourage you guys to consider that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We're going to have um, our executive report and tell the board that the was, um, oh, a letter was brought forward um, from a family that had gotten a, a statement saying that attorney fees had been placed um, on the letter, families get a letter every year stating 
And this particular um, letter had an error in it that listed attorney fees. And basically those fees should have been paid out of operations as opposed to purchase of service. And so it, it was an error. Um, it had been corrected back early in uh, 2011. And uh, all of those records were reviewed. There were no other consumers that experienced the same issue. Um, but the department wanted us to know that the letter has been sent to the state controller's office. There were discussions about board training, staff training, and training um, that would be put in place to support our training directors. And they, overall, the department felt as though things were moving forward in a positive way, um, but there is always work to do, and that we needed to keep on that path. Okay, thank you, Kim. Also, in relationship to um, our discussion with uh, the people from DDS, uh, Dr. Cutler had prepared a statement to present tonight because there was some concern about um, information that had been submitted to DDS and people feeling uncomfortable to share in person. So if I could just read this letter from, from Dr. Cutler to you. <coughs> He says, as he begins this comment for this evening, I want to start with a topic that is an important concern for all of us right now, how employees' morale is. Over the past few weeks, several staff members have come forward anonymously to share concerns regarding issues and policies that are spurning low morale. First and foremost, we thank everyone who has come forward and continue to encourage any employee who has concern to share them with the management and the board for Emory Regional Center. We understand that there is a fear to share information, but let me reiterate, our whistleblower's policy is in full effect. To that point, we are now in the process of implementing an audit committee as the next phase of the whistleblower's procedures. In addition, we are working on a short-range plan that will further encourage employees to not only share their concerns, but more so voice their recommendations in an arena where they feel safe. We all knew that existing probation would require a lot of work and a great deal of change within our organization. And make no doubt about it, change is hard. The board and management top priority has been and will be okay. to work together to lead in a regional center on a path where we provide exceptional service to individuals with developmental disabilities. Thank you. Um, we'll not have a financial report. Our two new directors, um, and I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Gustavo Rodriguez, who is our director of financial services. Would you like to stand? You can stay right there for a minute. Okay. <laughs> and Salon Escobar, who uh, is filling the position of director of community services. Um, thank you very much. Both of the of the men come to us with a great deal of background in health and human services and nonprofit corporations. Um, <coughs> Russ has a very extensive background in healthcare. Uh, came out of the hospital world. Uh, worked with both large and small hospitals. Uh, many many were on the nonprofit end, as well as had a few that were on profit making. Um, did small community hospitals uh, all the way to senior cycle. So he has a great deal of experience in working with contracts, granting, negotiations, working um, in the whole area of Medi-Cal and trying to juggle those books as well. Not juggle. <laughs> Manage those books. <laughs> Balance that. <laughs> we don't cook the books, right? Uh, Salon has come to us also working with a number of nonprofit corporations. Um, in finance, negotiations, grants, contracting. 
and um, both gentlemen have attained their master's in business administration um, and have worked certainly in the finance world. Um, Salant has some added experience in working um, in the public arenas with having to be responsible for being out in the press and always presenting that message of the corporation and has done strategic planning and long-range planning for corporations. So both of them have a great number of skills and talents that will really benefit our organization. And this is the beginning of their third week um, with us, so we're very pleased. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to, again, uh, take a moment and thank you all for being here tonight and helping us look back where we've been, and also moving forward. Um, I think that, that one of the things that comes to my mind when we look at starting centers and having those come alive is when you look at the Lanterman's legislation and what all was intended for people with disabilities, and when you see it work in the way that this center has been able to do that, um, you can see the power of what that piece of legislation put into place for people with disabilities. And it's, it's really exciting to be able to come together and celebrate 40 years of making things happen in this community and making it work together for the people that we support. So thank you all for being here. Um, we had a good report on the Medicaid waiver. I know you've been uh, hearing about that for several months. And every two years, the Medicaid waiver audit does happen. And we had a very, very good report this year. Uh, staff just did an excellent job of preparing and getting things put together. Those of you that have worked here, you know what that's like. And uh, the team did a wonderful job, and we came back with um, good suggestions, good recommendations, um, and also a lot of accolades and pass on the back for the job that we did. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. Um, let's see. I think probably um, one of the things I do want to share with you is that um, Gus will be talking with you just a little bit about the fact that our spending situation at this point, um, we're in a deficit for operations and we are also in a deficit position for purchase of service. And we'll be looking at different methods and means of bringing that into the positive side. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, and we've got to get, especially the operation side, balanced. And so we're going to be working on that. Um, we had the opportunity of having um, the administrator from Alpha Regional Center work with us uh, to learn some of the ins and outs about the regional center system and how the reporting works and some of that kind of thing. And that was very, very helpful um, to bring that, those ideas and those issues together and to give him some tips on how to make that work better. Uh, let's see. I think that that, well, I have one other, other thing that um, came up as a question in your meeting last um, month, last time. Had to do, you were interested in kind of the turnover rate of the way we ended the year in 2011. And at that point, at the, at, at the end of December, we had 51 people that had left the organization. 37 of those individuals were voluntary, <coughs> and 14 of those were involuntary. And when you look at the overall average of the turnover percentage, it was about 9.4, which is minimal. Um, for the size of organization that we have. And uh, staff has done a very good job of working along with <coughs> individuals and doing the coaching and the mentoring that is really needed um, to help staff move forward in a really positive way. And so we felt very good about the way that the year ended. And that was a question that had come up last in last board meeting, so I wanted to share that with you. Any questions?
good evening again. Um, Pablo Rodriguez, the group director of financial services. And, um, I'll I spoke with Patrick um, late this afternoon about the financial reports uh, that I will uh, someday have included in the packet uh, for this month. And the uh, numbers are projecting a little higher than uh, what they were in December. Um, the, the, the thing that we're doing with the financials right now, which I can tell you for the last two weeks, has been a smooth process of transitioning uh, the documentation and the information from um, the It's been a little bit uh, of a bumpy road to follow the audit trail and to document and to uh, have a comparative uh, set of financial statements to go back to the last set of financials that I had before December against um, average. And <clears throat> in the process of doing that comparative analysis, um, as of um, Friday, I realized that I need to prep, prep the numbers um, a lot. The numbers that I'm seeing as of December in certain areas appear to be a little bit soft in other for documented as I would have wanted it to. And it, as of that day, we were projecting uh, a loss, so it's good, uh, well of that. And the number that uh, we were coming up for um, to the end of February was a little higher. To the extent that I have no doubt on the numbers as of December because I cannot verify them and validate them, my template right now has all the information for December as I found it, plus all the numbers that we have following the format and the procedures that I was able to uh, validate in our credit system. So enough, enough, enough um, questions came up during, during my review that I need to press test the number using some of the banking terminology nowadays. And, and by, that mean, by that I mean, <coughs> there are things that have to do with our cut up pay because we put the reports on the system. What is the last one of the payables that are included at month end? Which is the last pay period that is included at month end? So I need to, I need to verify those cutoffs to make sure that I'm protecting accurately for the next four months what remains of the current fiscal year. I need to account for extraordinary items that my predecessor had accounted for as of December. Some of those extraordinary items may have already been paid. But now I have new extraordinary items that I need to account and project to the rest of you. Extraordinary items have to do with employee payouts, have to do with some uh, extraordinary expenses with uh, professional services. Um, and part of the process of doing the financials for the first time over the last two weeks, it's been to verify the numbers as we see them, do our comparative uh, input to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, and that uh, we document the process as we go along. The documentation that I had to go by was a little bit skimpy, so we're having to do a little bit of double acting on the numbers. Where did this number come up in uh, December? We need to make sure that it's the same number that we're putting for this month. And so for, for that reason, I don't have, I spoke with Carol this afternoon, I said, I don't feel comfortable, actually it was over the weekend, I don't feel comfortable to send you the, the finalized set of financial statements because I have more stress testing to do on the reports. Um, I hope to have all the information validated, stress tested, and documented that we can um, then email the report to each uh, board member um, shortly after we complete it. I hope to have that done by um, today's Monday. Uh, we have the preliminary numbers. Uh, we're, about, we're in the process of validating everything again. And uh, I'm working with two people that are assisting me. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm thinking that to be safe by Friday, we will have the financial statements or sooner. Yes, sir. Does, does the deficit appear to be greater or smaller than your predecessor led us to believe? Uh, this, is, this is part of the, the, the process that I have. As of 
of November, according to the financial statements that I see on the books, the VERIS was uh, close to 400,000, negative. As of December, that number had dropped down to about 300. Um, now I'm projecting a little higher. So the number, is, it, 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 but, but the problem was that as I look at his financials for November, December, um, there's about three or four uh, versions of, uh, well, there's two for November, two versions. Yeah. And, and so it, it seems that he was um, maybe adjusting the numbers on the fly. And, and so that is part of my process. The, the, the process is not hard coded. It, it involves a lot of um, judgmental, uh, a lot of uh, judgmental decision making. And, and part of the judgmental decision making has to do with projecting uh, the payroll expenses to, to the end of the year and also um, projecting um, on the uh, side that uh, uh, make it. On the operation side, we have a surplus on the non-payroll non items. And we seem to have a significant deficit on the payroll side. So, so that is the part that I'm really going to be stress testing. Now that I have all the information in the template, now I'm going to be stress testing those numbers. But looking back at his template, what was seen clearly, because we, we can buy it now, and I can have a, the same number in order to come to the system and have a time, but I need to be satisfied. I think the ownership of that projection he had for December, so that I know that I'm putting the right numbers and it, 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 it makes no sense to have apples to apples if I'm deciding with the wrong assumption anyway. So I need to take ownership of these projections as of December to move forward. So now, on, that's on the operation side. On the um, not <laughs> ops and POS aspect. Okay, POS is your, uh, your purchase services. On the purchase services, the biggest question that I have right now is the Carol mentioned a uh, gentleman that came in to help me from uh, the uh, Sacramento office. He's a, you know, what I call a guru in the business. He's been around in this uh, business for a long time. And he was a, he, he was a joy to have for a couple of days in the way that he shared his experience with me and he brought some special reports and he helped me uh, download some information quickly from the system and automate the process to where he populated a template that he shared with me and quickly download information and populate an Excel spreadsheet. We could not, with his help, I, we, we had difficulty validating the um, late bills as of December that were being projected in financials for Mr. Michael um, Taylor. Now, I'm not saying he was doing it wrong. I'm just saying that I'm, uh, he and I had a, a little bit of a problem following his numbers. <coughs> so this is part of the stress testing that I need to do on both the POS and the upside. On the upside is the payroll, and I need to validate down to the employee level, because we project both. And on the, on the POS side, uh, <coughs> the, the, the late bills. So having, I hope I'm not being uh, confused. The issue is more than, you know, maybe, maybe uh, any, any other questions about my process and what I'm going to? On the, on the off side, is the surplus in the non-payroll items greater than the deficit in the payroll areas? No, and that, that's why we have a deficit, because on the payroll deficit, it's greater than the, the, the non-payroll non um, surplus. Okay. And it's my understanding from our conference call, the state's been pretty clear that they're not going to provide us any more ops money. Is that still? That's correct. That's, okay. that's my understanding, too. So if we don't, if the board, because any cuts is a policy issue, <coughs> not a staff issue, it's a policy issue, at least in my opinion. So if we have to balance the budget, what happens if we don't balance the budget? Where does that money come from? I'm not going to write you a check. <laughs> my understanding is that you cannot uh, go to the end of the year without a check. And that's, that's my understanding from the gentleman who came in to help us, and that's, that's what the open understanding is. Um, and that was the predecessor's understanding. That's correct. That's correct. And it's part of the funding, uh, the way the way it works. And I understand also that if we end up with a surplus, then DPS may allocate those surpluses to other places. So it's, it's so we have to be very accurate on how we end the year. We have to deny the deficit, and we don't want to have surpluses for other reasons. So that requires a management uh, plan on implementation of what states we need to do. Um, Carol has been very proactive with uh, us, the directors, on, on, uh, on looking at that. But, uh, 
We have to edit it one. We have to come in at zero. And we will be meeting with the managers tomorrow to work on a plan uh, to do that. We have kind of a, a ballpark number that we're working towards. I'm going to talk about this later, but I'll bring it up now. If we don't meet again until May the 14th, will that six weeks give us enough time to save between three and four hundred thousand dollars? No, we need to act quickly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, my understanding on the op side or on the POS side is that it was somewhere in the twenty to twenty million, twenty to twenty-five million dollar mark. Okay. Am I still not that old that I can remember? That would be the next budget time. Okay. Uh, oh, with, with one qualifier, my um, lay bills that I'm prepared to meet at the end of February versus the lay bills that were projected in December, I'm coming out with that last day. So that is a that's positive. It, it, so, so from that perspective, uh, it's good that the DPS thinks that we have this huge amount of money <coughs> coming out because then uh, we have a, an opportunity to maybe come in lower and that's that plus. It's the operation side that uh, is the work of us. Do we have an obligation, or should we politically notice the state on the POS side who are anticipating it? I mean, that's a substantial sum of money. Um, I mean, for um, every month, there's what's called the sufficiency of allocation report that does go to the state, and it, it indicates from and gives the state a picture of where we are. And so they're, they're very well aware. <coughs> It's not a secret in any way. Yeah, we sent that report monthly. As a matter of fact, that's what I was um, in the process of um, doing today with um, one of my managers, uh, putting it together because it needs to go out tomorrow. And, and that's, that's part of that uh, process that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And that's what we uh, looked at the uh, label. And <coughs> that number versus what we were able to project in the table. Be that way, but that's where our costs are. Well, I think it. I think. 